So hi and welcome everyone to the second session of MOL VA. Uh, in this session we'll have another two uh, exciting scientific talks and uh, I guess even uh, equally exciting uh, keynote or capstone talk. Um, and we'll start with the first scientific talk called uh, Improved Umbrella Visualization Implemented in Unity MOL Gives Valuable Insight on Sugar Protein Interplay. The talk will be given by Nicolas Belois. So stage is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, okay, let's start. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizer of the conference and the workshop for allowing me to present um, the results. Oh. Okay, the results. Uh, associated to the work of Camille Besançon thesis and uh, having accepting our short paper. So um, we are interested in glycosylation and uh, glycosylation are post-translational modification on the surface of protein that are made up of sugar chains. And they have a great structural diversity and are also recognition sites for glycan uh, binding protein, GBPs and uh, are essential to the maturation and function of proteins. Glycosylation are also uh, markers in uh, age-related pathologies. And here, you have some examples of, uh, of chain found in uh, different spaces according to the uh, uh, standard used in the community, the symbol nomenclature for glycans. And on the right here, um, an example of uh, what can be observed in molecular, uh, molecular modeling software. So the starting point of, uh, for this work is the impact of uh, destialization of the insulin receptor and the biological uh, phenomena associated with it. Uh, this phenomenon is induced by uh, the elastin receptor complex. And in this uh, receptor complex, the neuraminidase 1 uh, subunit hydrolyzes uh, silic acids which induce insulin resistance in cells. And uh, we are therefore interested in the impact of decellulation uh, on the dynamic and flexibility uh, of glycan. And we have shown that decellulation causes a change in the proportion of the different observed conformation uh, during uh, MD simulation. So in the context of this work, we have developed an original approach which considers the glycan acting uh, uh, as an umbrella. And uh, on the surface of the protein, this umbrella mask residues below. And the principle is as follows. The core of the glycan uh, is aligned along the Z axis. The end of the two branches of the glycan are then projected onto uh, its Y plane in order to appreciate the area co uh, explored by the glycan during uh, MD simulation. And this information is this therefore translated uh, into a two-dimensional density graph. And this is how we were able to characterize the changes between families of conformation induced by the removal of sialic acids. In the study mentioned on this slide, umbrella visualization was used in order to characterize uh, uh, isolated glycan chain and their intrinsic properties. If, you, if we want to apply the methodology to more realistic systems such as glycosylated proteins, we have to consider both protein topology and the whole glycan chain. The best way to do this uh, is to implement the umbrella visualization in uh, existing visualization software. In order to carry this approach, we rely on the Unity Model software developed, developed on the Unity 3D uh, platform because it integrates uh, the classical representation mode using molecular graphics. And here, for example, surface representation of the protein and uh, glycan in a van der Waals sphere. The implement implementation of the umbrella visualization in Unity Model is based on the use of Unity prefabs. Uh, which are templates made of diff different Unity objects. This allowed us to reproduce uh, the coordinate system and orient the element of the prefab. We use uh, two atoms of the modified uh, asparagine, the one carrying uh, glycosylation, uh, to uh, orient our system along the Z axis. And a camera and a diagonal light uh, make it possible to render the shadow casts 
in a render texture, which can thus be used on a static structure. The update uh, during uh, the reading of a molecular dynamic trajectory allows the accumulation and compilation of information in a results file, which in both uh, cases is at the end of the procedure plated on the surface of the protein by the projector. This device makes it possible to average information during uh, a simulation and have to include statistical information over frames. Here you have an example of what it is possible to obtain with our tool. We first represent the glycanic clocks in a classical all atom mode using Van der Waals spheres. Uh, and then you have the result of the projection in a, of a static view of the glycan on the surface of the protein. And fi finally, in grade level, the result of the statistical information during the trajectory of a molecular dynamic simulation. The glycan uh, atoms are no longer displayed for clarity, no longer just the end. Uh, 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 sorry, and the first improvement here is a projection of the whole shadow of the glycan and no longer just the ends of the branches as in, uh, in the original 2D version. Uh, some flexibility is left to the end user who decide how many frames of molecular dynamics type story are used for the calculation. And here, from 250 frames to uh, 10,000 frames, and uh, uh, it requires between 30 seconds and 25 minutes of calculation. The time spent is longer, but make it possible to highlight uh, less explore region, which can uh, constitute rare events of biological uh, relevance. Among the utilities associated with uh, the implementation of umbrella visualization in Unity mode, is it possible to choose between two modes of representation of the stati statistical information? As you can see with this study of the glycosylated uh, insulin receptor, the use of contour rendering improves the upper uh, appreci appreciation of uh, region explored by the glycan. Uh, the classic uh, grayscale model can, can be blurry. Uh, while um, the use of a scale of uh, HAs of gray simplifies our identification of equivalently covered uh, area and their boundaries. In order to help the user in characterizing the relevant interaction between protein and glycans, uh, we have implemented a projection system which allows us to couple the shadow of the glycan, the atoms of the impact residues and physical chemical pro properties on the same map. Here is shown the results of an analysis where the physical property of interest uh, for the protein is its surface hydrophobicity according to the Kate and Doolittle scale. A better understanding is provided uh, uh, concerning the relationship between the glycan and the residues below. And the system is quite simple within a sphere of a given radius. Every atom detected are projected on the sphere and then proje projected from the North Pole on the plane. The combination um, of the different elements developed in the, uh, uh, in the umbrella visualization show here the region explored by the glycan and the different representation in the projection system. Applied to MD simulation of uh, a glycosylated insulin receptor, we can underline once again the relevance of a statistical treatment of a given uh, trajectory. Uh, it obviously uh, allows the uh, identification of, uh, in a better way of the atom of the protein surface that are interacting with the glycosylated chain. In addition, for clarity purpose, we do not add the coloring associated to the hydrophobicity scale on this slide. But when we use it, uh, we are, are able to observe the color localization or, or not of atom from here, for example, charge residues, a glutamate, and an asparagine. So to conclude, uh, uh, we extend the capabilities of umbra visualization in uh, the Unity Molecular Viewer uh, and added a uh, render, new uh, rendering mode. Uh, the analysis of the trajectories uh, can seem quite long, but it's a relatively short time compared to the time devoted to uh, the generation of data. And this uh, extension of the Unity Multiver offers a new visual way to analyze complex phenomena comparatively to geometrical consideration. 
and a link with experimental data could be addressed by dissecting accessibility to residues involved in protein-protein or in glycan-mediated interaction. And the approach, approach as previously descri described is efficient on the globular domain of protein. So uh, to finish, if I want, have to convince you of the interest represented by glycans, uh, I show here the analysis of the site and types of glycosylation uh, present on the surface of the spike protein of SARS-CoV-19. And then here, a view of a trajectory of molecular dynamics produced by Woods and uh, colleagues on uh, this protein, which shows the important role of uh, glycan, uh, that glycan play in accessibility to the protein sites, and therefore the need to uh, develop tools to dissect this uh, molecular dynamics. So we'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, the member of uh, our team in uh, Besançon, uh, Manuel Doshia, our group leader, Jessica Jonquet and Stephanie Bo, who supervised with myself the work of uh, Camille Besançon. We are wrong with, uh, with uh, Camille that uh, developed uh, the umbrella visualization. Um, Mark Baden and Xavier Martinez for their support uh, with the use of Unity Mall. Elisa Fadot, Serge Perez, Nicolas Ferret, uh, who participate in a uh, follow-up uh, committee uh, of Camille Besançon thesis and uh, uh, HPC resources uh, in, here in Arras in, in Montpellier. You for your attention and thank you. Okay, thank you, Nicola, for the interesting talk. Um, we have plenty of time for questions, if there are any. Um, let me check the uh, YouTube and Discord. Uh, maybe let me start uh, with one. Um, so I'm sorry, maybe I just missed this in your presentation. But when you talked about yeah. how to how you project uh, the um, the glycans onto the surface. Uh, what algorithm do you use for this for this projection to into two D? Uh, you mean on this? Sorry, on, on this slide? Uh, yes, exactly. In fact, all the elements are embedded in uh, the in the Unity Mall uh, and uh, Unity three D platform. And we use uh, prefab that are templates mm -hmm. uh, already uh, available in the software. It, it's, it's a combination of all these elements that uh, allowed us to project uh, at the end uh, the texture uh, compute for uh, along the molecular dynamics simulation. Okay, so you project to the two D uh, texture and then just wrap this yeah. at Unity wrap this onto. It, yeah. so. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have another question. Uh, Bjorn asks, what are the limitations of your approach? Uh, he guesses that Unity is quite limited in terms of structure size. Did you encounter any problems, any issues here? Uh, till now, the biggest system that we are working on is the insulin receptor, which is uh, nearly 30,000 uh, of atoms, because we remove water before analysis. Uh, and it it takes uh, thirty minutes to analyze uh, the dy dynamics of one glycan at the surface of the protein. But the rendering itself is then no issue afterwards. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, while we are waiting for more questions, I actually have another one. Um, yeah. I, I really like your idea of this. Uh, toned down contour maps that you don't show the smooth uh, distribution, but this, uh, yeah, if this is the contours, this discrete uh, contours. Mm -hmm. um, did you actually evaluate uh, which visualization is more effective? Um, the, so, so which one works better for, for users? Which one is easier to understand? Or was it this just an intuition uh, by, by you? No, even for, for us, uh, the use of contour is uh, clearly a, a plus because uh, the classical display is, is blurry and you can 
uh, easily miss some region of interest, while where are their uh, clear boundaries are defined, uh, it's easier to then uh, analyze the residues of the protein that are below. So it's really uh, a very interesting feature, in fact. Okay, we have one more question. Um, okay. So, uh, do you make use uh, of virtual reality? So, Unity Mall is uh, supporting virtual reality, and would that be uh, useful in your case for your application? Uh, we have not tested yet uh, the combination of our tool with, with virtual re reality. We use virtual re reality, but for other projects, mm -hmm. not for. Uh, most for sim uh, simulation tools, not for analysis. Uh, but since uh, it's uh, already embedded in a uh, Unity model, uh, maybe, yes, in the near future, we can uh, try uh, to combine both. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Um, Welcome. If there are no more questions, uh, at least not right now, I think we can move on to the second talk and of course we can uh, thank Nicola again um, thank for, for the nice talk uh, we can of course uh, everyone can write uh, comments in the discord and then questions there and uh, I hope that Nicola will be able to then check the discord channel afterwards if something else pops up so let's uh, move on to the second speaker um, the while well, the tech is set up um, so this, uh, the second talk is uh, entitled Mesoscope, a web-based tool for mesoscale data integration and curation. And the talk will be given by Ludovic Autin. Yes. Should I share my screen now? Uh, yes, please. All right. Is that okay? Thumb up. All right. So first, uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, at this uh, great workshop. The presentation so far was uh, amazing. And so my name is uh, Ludovic Potin, and I'm a staff scientist uh, at the Scripps Research Institute, uh, La Jolla, California. And today I'm going to present to you uh, Mesoscope, a web-based tool for Mesoscope data integration and curation. I'll, I'll start with uh, uh, a short context about the mesoscale, and then I've give you a description of the website, and I finish by some application uh, that we do in the lab. So, what what is the the mesoscale? So we can define the biological mesoscale uh, is the scale that includes biological structure that range from ten to hundred uh, nanometer, and uh, the structure in this range include large molecular complex uh, viruses, cellular organelles and any other internal cellular environment with that range. Now, in terms of method of study to visualize this structure, uh, we have uh, X-ray crystallography that will show us um, large mega complex, but in isolation. And on the uh, other side, we can have uh, electronic or uh, light microscopy that will show us a larger environment, but without uh, molecular detail. So we can say that there is actually not a single experimental technique that can visualize the three-dimensional structure of uh, cellular environment at the molecular scale and giving you atomic detail. And to give you an example, uh, that's the SARS-CoV-2 uh, latest images. And uh, this uh, micrograph show you that we are really fuzzy and you cannot tell the structure inside the virus. And so one of the first uh, to have look into this problem and try to depict how things look like uh, at the micro scale is uh, David Goodsell. So not only is a, is a brilliant scientist, he's also a, a talented uh, uh, artist. And here he, I show um, one of his uh, water uh, colored painting about the virus. And he, he was able to do it like yeah, in a week. And his process is, uh, is interesting. He's doing a lot of literature research and reading to find out what are the protein involved uh, in the system. And then you try to find structure for them and look up how many there are and how they look like, how they are distributed. And he started his uh, process of painting. 
But of course, these are uh, only uh, 2D uh, static images. So every time there is new information coming about the system, he will have to uh, redraw them and repaint them. So that's why there is a growing interest in uh, building a model of this system, an actual accurate 3D model. And that's what we do in, uh, in our lab. So today I'm not going to talk about how we build this model, but I'm going to talk about uh, what is the data that we, are, that we need to build uh, such model and how to handle and look at the data. So to give you an example, I show uh, the uh, influenza virus. And so what do we need to build such model? So we're going to need uh, a compartment or the envelope of the virus. And we're going to need to find out what are the protein or what we're going to ingredient that are going to go in uh, the compartment and where at the surface when it's like, and also how many and what do they look like. And we need to gather this data in different resources. Or we're going to have to look at our experimental tomogram, um, proteomic studies, um, molecular structure, and if there is none, we maybe have to do homology modeling, and of course, a lot of literature already. And so all of this data, uh, we summarized and integrated it in uh, something that we call a recipe. Uh, however, this process is uh, tedious and manual, so we decide to develop a neutral mesoscope where we could put everything together in one place, and hopefully this will help us um, go uh, quickly in the, in the creation of all data. So let me give you a small overview of uh, Mesoscope. So it's a, it's a website, and it's a simple front-end uh, written in Japanese JavaScript. And it's based on a lot of third-party library. And one of the first one is the golden layout, because we designed the website um, based on four different main tabs. And these tabs can be uh, dynamically move around, and so the user can uh, set up his own more comfortable layout. And so the and this different tab, I'm going to start with the first one, the, the recipe view, which is um, an abstract view of the recipe. And it's based on the D3 library, which is a data visualization library. And uh, next to it is going to be a recipe table, which is the same recipe data, but uh, as a spreadsheet. And we use the Slick Grid library. And for the individual protein, um, we have a structure view uh, tab. And we decide to use the NGR viewer from Alexander Ross. And to have uh, more information about structure, we need to look at sequence. So we use um, currently available library, such as uh, this and the PDP component library. And so the, the point of entry, uh, the point of entry of the, of the, of the website is um, either you can create manually uh, your recipe, your system in the, in the recipe viewer, or we can load existing recipe, and finally, to uh, to share things with people that are not uh, familiar with this, we can uh, import spreadsheets. So let me start with the, the recipe view. So again, it's the visual abstract. We were trying to find out what's the best way to to visualize a recipe and and how to create them easily. So I can quickly create compartment and ingredient. I can change the color, and everything is dynamic. And it's, it's pretty neat because D3 is really efficient at uh, handling simple circle and physics. And everything is shared with the, the table and we can quickly go back, uh, go back and forth. But this is okay when you do a, a smaller recipe. When we need a bigger recipe, uh, we need to load them from existing file that can come from uh, another program. So here I'm gonna show you an example with uh, an exosome, which is a, a small vesicle. And again, we can uh, visualize differently with some sprite, and we can change how we label things. Um, we can put the name, the PDB, the Unipod code, and we can move things around, and we can color or change the size of them if, uh, according to different parameters we have uh, in the recipe. And of course, sometimes you work with uh, biologists, and they work with spreadsheet. And the problem with the spreadsheet is you don't know in advance uh, how we're going to name the colon, uh, where we're going to put the information. So what we did is we developed um, an interface to help the user do the mapping between his information and what is expected uh, in Mesoscope. 
like the, the protein name, the PDB, the Uniprot number, the localization, so, so that we can get everything up uh, in the system. And again, everything is shared between all the different tabs. And we can go back uh, forth and back uh, with the table. And the table is really the spreadsheet. And we use SlickGrid because uh, it's a really neat library where you can, you know, uh, resize the colon, sort the colon, uh, group them to give you a better idea of uh, how things are organized. And again, we can access individual uh, row that we than protein, and so that we can directly highlight them, and they will show up in the uh, over tab. And so we can go further in the curation of all the entry and look at, for instance, at their uh, structure. And so to look at the structure, we decide to use NGR because it's a full feature molecular viewer. So we can access uh, the RCSB PDB files. We can go to the oriented protein membrane and we can load our custom files. And it also provides all the augmentation available in the molecular viewer, the coloring scheme. And so it, it's pretty neat. And on top of it, we can uh, access the API and generate ourselves the geometry that we can use for uh, further augmentation and uh, model building because Sometimes we need to have access to low resolution meshes. And uh, another feature that we were really uh, looking into is we need to build a low resolution augmentation of this protein and based on bids. And so here I was doing uh, uh, k means clustering so I could control the number of bids that were on the protein and their size. And, and another important feature is you want to be able to uh, curate and maybe replace the orientation of the protein in the membrane so that we can do it here uh, uh, easily. And one final thing that we use in GR4 is we can generate spread given uh, an orientation. And here I give an example using uh, David Goodsell Illustrate software that gives a really nice rendering for proteins. But to help us look at this uh, structure, we need to look also at the sequence. So, we synchronize the NGR viewer with the different uh, library that uh, expose the sequence information from uh, different sources. And it's really interesting when you can actually highlight, for instance, uh, transmembrane uh, domain or extracellular domain. So you can really uh, curate and decide that, okay, uh, this is the proper orientation for this protein uh, in this membrane. And so typically, you will have to do that for uh, every protein uh, in the system, one after another. And to be sure that they are properly oriented, we have the proper uh, chain selection or biological unit. And, so, and once uh, you're done, uh, the mesoscope will offer you um, the, the possibility to export uh, as a file. And so it's a it's, um, simple JSON dictionary, and it's it's what we call a recipe that's going to list all the compartment uh, surface and interior ingredients and their description. And that's what we need to build uh, a model. And so how, how, how do we build a model in the lab? So I'm going to go through the different way we do it. Um, the, f the first one is um, our uh, initial software, Cellpack. And it was using meshes and bit augmentation to do the distribution and the augmentation. And it was uh, developed as a plugin inside a third party software such as uh, Maxon Cinema 4D or Blender. Uh, however, we uh, uh, quickly found out uh, there was a limitation. We couldn't uh, go uh, uh, as big as we wanted. So, for a small virus, it would be fine, but going to a, a bacteria, it will, it will not be possible. There will be no real time visualization and it will take forever to have the model show up. And so that's why we started uh, a collaboration with uh, Ivan Viola's group. And with Material Music, uh, we developed a way to visualize this uh, big model in real time. And then with Tobias playing, we were able to port cell back uh, directly on GPU. And it was uh, a great breakthrough. I mean, we were able to build uh, this gigantic uh, model with uh, actual data. And, but in the same time, uh, we, we developed with Adam Garner and David Russell a uh, cell pain 2D. And it's a little different approach where here we want the user to be able to brush 
and build himself uh, illustration that will look like David's painting. And we did that for outreach and education. And finally, we, we had the idea to merge together the brush ID and the atomistic view in the virtual reality environment to see if it would help to have a uh, free degree freedom when building such complex uh, scene. And, and, and of course, all of this method will generate some models. But what do we do with this model? So the first thing we want to do is to outreach and share them. And the, the, the best way we found to do it was to uh, collaborate with Alexander Rose and make it so we could load uh, this model in a web viewer, which is more stuff. And so we could uh, interactively uh, look at this model in time in the web browser. And that was also a, a great breakthrough for us. It's currently, um, we are still working on this. And another way we want to do outreach is a 3D printed model because this model can be loaded in a in third party 3D software where we can then send them to a 3D printer. But what is more interesting for us is uh, to, to use this model to have an understanding of what, um, or sorry, uh, the question would be, can we find emerging behavior uh, from this model by doing the minimum simulation? So I will give you quickly some example uh, of what we did uh, in the recent year. Here is a molecular dynamic uh, of the influenza virus. And the challenge here was to visualize it. So we worked with material music and we were able to display the trajectory uh, in real time uh, in Serview. And another great example is here is a rigid body, body and, uh, dynamic with a uh, software called BDBox and it's based on the HIV model. And again, with Mathieu, we, we were able to visualize in real time the trajectory. But uh, what is more interesting is nowadays we're working with Android Chouette and this small tampering software, which is uh, uh, a software to control LAMP simulation. So we took uh, our cell pack model, and then we use multiple lamps to uh, start by relaxing them to remove any uh, remaining overlap. And it's quite encouraging because we want in the future to use this approach to put more constraint in the simulation and finally maybe be able to see emerging uh, behavior. And finally, I'd like to finish with uh, another application uh, that we try to um, uh, so bring the gap between the experiment and the model. And so since we have the atomic information, we can do a synthetic image simulation. So for instance, with uh, the Allen Institute, we can do a fluorescence simulation. We can take a slice of a human cell and distribute protein uh, at the surface and inside, pick one and act as it was uh, a fluorescence um, protein. And then we can compare with the experimental data so we can compare the distribution. Uh, another example is uh, tomogram and EM. So here is uh, an experimental image of the HIV envelope protein that is highly distributed here on this vehicle. So we can build model based on it, and then we can uh, generate a synthetic image. And so we can compare back and forth the experiment and the simulation. And more uh, recently, uh, we were working on the, with the beta cell consortium and we were studying the insulin secretory uh, granules. And again, since we have the atomic uh, information, uh, we can actually calculate the, uh, the photon linear absorption, and then we can reproject and get experiment, uh, synthetic uh, soft X-ray image. And the idea was to do that, to compare how it looks like the mature uh, uh, regard, in regard to the immature vesicle. And that's it for me. Uh, I'd like, before finishing, uh, acknowledge and thanks all my collaborators, uh, Ivan and Tobias, uh, Mark Scover, Troy Stevens, Alexander Rose, and Graham Johnson. I also would like to thank uh, my uh, dynamic co worker from the Center for Computational Biology, uh, because, you know, it takes a village to be the virtual self. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, thank you, uh, Ludwig, for the talk. Uh, we have maybe time for one quick question. Um, so, um, one question here is, uh, 
do you know more about the dynamic simulations that is used that was used in your example? So what kind of simulation uh, is used here? Uh, the one I was showing? Yes, I think so. Uh, the, um, the influenza was uh, an AMD uh, simulation on the... Uh, but you, you want to know the number of atom or...? Uh, I think the, the question means what, what kind of simulation, what type of simulation. I mean, it's obviously not a full molecular dynamics simulation, but something... Oh, it is. Ah, it is. Okay. 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 I think no, I guess no, it, uh, the, uh, the influenza is a full atomistic uh, simulation. Okay, I, I guess. Then the, the other one was uh, cross grain or mm -hmm. dynamic. Okay, uh, yeah, sorry to, to cut questions short a little bit because of uh, the time. Um, as uh, for the last talk, I think, uh, I hope that uh, Ludovic will be around uh, in the Discord during the week, and if something uh, pops up, uh, he can maybe answer questions there. So let's thank Ludo again and uh, thank you. move on to our invited talk, mm -hmm. our invited speaker who will be introduced by Bjorn. Right. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot for this uh, excellent talk, Ludo. Very, very great work again with CellPack. So I would like to introduce Perry shortly. So you all know his work. So basically, he will introduce his talk on molecular visualization and virtual reality, challenges and opportunities. So he will look into different limitations known from actual work I think it would have been quite interesting from my point of view to ask Ludovic, but there was no time for this anymore, how far he got with this um, VR approach in terms of cell pack. So this is actually what Perry is uh, working on. So how can you uh, push the boundaries behind uh, the mouse and the keyboard in this context? So challenges is looking into his data visualization, accurate selection interaction. I think his most cited paper is in this field of accurate selection. How can you do this? Um, how can you facilitate collaboration? And he's also looking into immersive analytics approach. And this is basically, I think, what you will talk about today. So he's associate professor um, in Catalonia at the Polytech University. So in, he's actually located in Barcelona, if I speak correctly. And he's working in the research center for visualization, virtual reality, and graphics interaction. Yeah, and uh, I think one of his last papers was about the visualization of large molecular tra trajectories, so which is a basic problem for all of us. So we are looking very much forward. I, won't, I don't want to steal more of your time, Barry. We are looking forward to your talk. Thanks a lot. OK, thanks a lot. Let me share the screen, please. Um, and Okay, hopefully you can see, okay, right? Okay, I hope so. I didn't hear you, Ludovic, Ludovic. Um, so I hope you're, you're, you're all listening to me. Okay, I cannot hear you, so I imagine that, that you are... Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, fun. sorry, thanks. So, uh, let's go for, for, for this. Um, um, first, as uh, you introduced me, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me to give this talk, and I'm, I, I would like to talk a little bit about VR, uh, molecular visualization and VR. Uh, as you said, I'm associate professor at uh, Universidad Politecnica de Catalunya and within the Burbick Group. So one thing that you might wonder is uh, why I'm interested in, or why should be interested in visualization, molecular visualization and virtual reality. So if you briefly Google a little bit about the intersection of uh, biometrics and VR, there you will find that there is a lot of interesting works going on. And if you wonder why me, I mean, why I'm interested in this, you probably know that I've been doing some molecular visualization stuff, but also uh, in my group, we also do some uh, 3D interaction techniques in, in virtual reality, mostly with medical models, but uh, we are also starting started, uh, working with uh, molecules. So um, just let, let's go to it. So over oversimplifying from the point of view of visual communication, 
we can consider that um, our molecular visualization commonly, commonly used 3D models, 2D widgets or customized views, whatever, and traditional charts. And we interact with those um, elements through several different techniques, filtering, sorting, selection, cross-selection, and so on and so forth. And uh, starting from this oversimplified version of our work, I was wondering whether we can make working this in virtual reality. So you might wonder, maybe it's uh, already solved because uh, if the first thing that might come to your mind is that there are several applications that already have ported uh, molecular visualization to virtual reality, such as Chimera, Chimera X, BMD, Unity Mall, or Nanome. But if you ask me, my answer would be a supreme no. I think uh, that there are a lot of things that can be improved and otherwise, of course, the talk would be too short. Unfortunately, when I was preparing this talk, although I started quite long ago, um, then the confinement arrived. So I've been uh, away from my lab for uh, almost three months now and I was not able to test everything I wanted to, and I had to ask to my colleagues to generate uh, some images to test some things, but you know, this is never like the real thing. So you will uh, excuse me if I say something that it's uh, not exact, or there are some features that I overlooked that it's probably what will happen. Anyways, let's go to it. Uh, I will constrain my talk in uh, this is a scenario. So I will talk about consumer grade HMD displays. I, I'm not going to talk about caves or power walls or high end HPC systems. And uh, because otherwise there will be a lot of uh, things to explain. And I will talk about challenges only in these three areas. So the display of information, both models and data presentation, interaction with some inf with this information. I would just uh, visit like three kind of task like filtering, selection, and navigation, and also collaboration, where I will talk a little bit about communication, users awareness, and interaction. I would like to talk also about perception, but unfortunately, I wouldn't have uh, time to do this. So molecular visualization can be enclosed into the emerging area of immersive analytics. Immersive analytics is defined as the use of engaging embodied analysis tools to support data understanding and decision making. And it builds upon fields we are familiar with, such as data visualization, visual analytics, or human computer interaction, but also virtual reality, computer graphics, and so on. And its goal is to remove barriers between people and their data and make visual analysis uh, accessible to everywhere, to uh, for everywhere to everyone. So if you Google a little bit in Google Scholar about immersive, immersive analytics, you will find that the number of entries that appear, of course, most of them are papers, but most of them are, are, is really, really growing. So this basically means that if we don't get into molecular visualization in VR, somebody else will probably go. So um, after I started this motivation, let's start with what I find that are um, challenges that we can find in the display of information of molecular data in, in, motor, in virtual reality. So in this area, we're concentrating two main problems, so the model rendering and the data presentation. What are the requirements that we face when we render uh, things in virtual reality? So in order to have something effectively rendered, we need to obtain frame rates of 60 to 90 frame, uh, frames per second. And these frames per second needs to be sustained for two eyes, this means generating like 180 frames per second. But the important word here is sustain. So frame rates cannot fall below certain uh, latencies, such as like 15 milliseconds, because otherwise they will cause motion sickness. And in this context, when we talk about latency, we do not refer to the common uh, meaning that we have in computer graphics, that it's the, the, the latency of generating one single frame but we also need to take into account the interaction, which is also known the motion to photon latency. So in, in most computer graphics applications and, and even mo uh, molecular rendering applications, we only address this part here and we measure our frame rates taking into account this, but in a real virtual reality scenario, we also have to account for the input of the user that also needs to be processed in order to change viewpoint, interact and so on and so forth. 
And this input, of course, it's not uh, free of cost. So why is it difficult to obtain such sustained frame rates in molecular models? So one of the first problems is the complexity of the geometry. So the, the molecular models can grow up to millions of, of atoms, and the shapes can be kind of complicated. I mean, we have simple atoms, but we also can have secondary structures. The, this makes it difficult to ensure a sustained high frame rate. Then we also like to add some other uh, elements, such as uh, um, sophisticated shading, because it helps us understanding the 3D. Uh, geometry. And um, these uh, high quality algorithms are typically GPU intensive, so they are costly. Moreover, in the idealist scenario, we also want to handle dynamic scenes, such as simulations. And you know that for handling these uh, dynamic scenes, it's difficult to take, to use uh, pre computed data structures because the, the, the overall scene is very, very huge. So um, from the previous literature, I only found one paper that was addressing this uh, time critical rendering, and it was on uh, for molecular data, data sets, and it was uh, on the concrete case of solvent excluded surfaces. They were creating uh, a voxels data structure, um, and then we, they were generating a number of triangles iteratively until a certain budget was, was reached. This was a view-dependent, uh, strategy, but it only works for static scenes, it does not deal with shading, and of course the voxel structure that was generated can be very uh, large if we want to uh, hold um, molecules of millions of atoms. But it could be a, a good starting point. In, in MOVIS we have also developed other um, kinds of techniques that have addressed the problem of fast uh, render, fast realistic rendering of molecules, such as, for instance, this approach of Hermosi and other, which was addressed to render high quality shading for uh, millions of atoms, or the one on the right by Schaffer and Crone, which was um, addressed to take advantage again of the GPU power to generate solvent exoid surfaces. Uh, we also know other usual suspects, such as progressive algorithms. In this case, for instance, and most young others were creating a progressive algorithm for rendering uh, solvent excluded surfaces on the fly. And uh, also, uh, some other usual suspects in computer graphics is uh, making use of approximations. In, in this case, for instance, and most young others were creating a, a a good approximation to simulate some sophisticated uh, shading effects as tr translucency in these molecules, which was pretty cheap and pretty fast. In, in a, a different kind of algorithms, um, such as uh, taking advantage of uh, an analytic uh, algorithms, we're using order to generate like pre-compute um, formulas that let you simulate uh, complex phenomena such as interreflections on amp or ambient occlusions in real time. So these two approaches by Scarnberg and a follow-up later on by Jan Mosilla was intended to, to do this. So in order to have this time critical rendering, we have the, the limiting factors of that first we will require larger resolutions and for current gaming scenarios i will talk about this later on and we have a computational power that is limited because in hmd displays we use the current pcs gpus if we try to move to uh, even fancier devices such as cordless, cordless devices um, these are less powerful so we are uh, even more limited in in, in power so in this case, we have uh, interesting opportunities into creating uh, time-critical molecular rendering algorithms, maybe by adapting previous research or creating newer ones, or even using forbidden rendering. So taking, making use of uh, the eye tracking facilities that modern HMD displays, uh, HMD um, systems um, uh, currently have, and uh, we imagine that it will have in the future. So let's move on to uh, a different thing. Uh, let's talk about data presentation. Know that I have grouped everything that, that, that it's not 3D models here. And ideally, uh, we would like to have the same features that we commonly find in Mobi's desktop application. So this means that we would like uh, to include at the, same, at the same time 
3D models and 2D views. And of course, we would like them to be coordinated, so we would like to be able to interact with both at the same time. So um, the good news is that, uh, at least in theory, h &D displays have a larger field of view than desktop monitors, which means that we have more virtual space to put elements into there. So naively, one might think that it would be easy to fit both 3D models to the views and interact with them. Unfortunately, the resolution of those devices is much lower, and this is very, very important. Why this is important? So because, uh, as I said, we need room for the 3D model. We need room for the charts. And the problem is that since the resolution is quite limited in HMD devices, elements that could be visible in a screen monitor are very difficult to perceive in uh, those devices because of allies, for instance. So if we have thin elements or we have uh, text, we need to render it at, at the much larger size than we would do in a, in a monitor because otherwise the aliasing effect makes the visualization quite uncomfortable. Even premium virtual reality devices have only 10 pixels per degree resolution, while the human eye resolution is around 60 pixels per degree. So ideally, we would like to have, if we want to mimic uh, at, or get close to the resolution our human eye have, has, we would like to have a device that it's 8K, that has something like five milliseconds of latency. This would mean that we need to generate 58 million pixels. And per second, we will need something like 23K million pixels per second, while high-end gaming uh, PCs have GPUs that are only able to render several hundred, uh, hundreds, million, millions of pixels per second. So we don't have the power now to generate even if we have this big device with 8K, we don't have the power to, to run something at the same conditions that we have in a gaming uh, PC. So in order to, to give you some numbers, um, if uh, these numbers were, were uh, taken from a Steam um, um, survey that did among their users, the most common single monitor configuration has resolution of uh, uh, 1920 per 1080 with a 60 hertz frequency. And the field of, well, the, the resolution of the monitor goes from 21 something until 30 inches for the best monitors. This actually means that uh, depending on the distance uh, you, you place yourself from the monitor, you will have a field of view of 40 something up to uh, 60 something degrees if you get close to the monitor and you have this big uh, 30 inches monitor. So in most cases, you will have something around 50 degrees. On the other hand, HMD devices have like two to three times this field of view because they go up to 110, 115, 120 degrees of field of view. And the, the frequency is it's larger because it's 90, 80, something like that. But the resolution is half, it's like 1080. So this means that basically the resolution that we have is six times less pixels per angular degree in an HMD. As a result, if we want to put text that it's legible, we require um, much larger fonts than usual. And uh, as a result, everything, charts, labels, whatever, will occupy a lot of the space. The consequence is that we cannot put as much information as we might uh, think that we could without occluding it. So um, let's talk a little bit about two types of information. First, I will talk a little bit about labels and menus, and then I will talk a little bit about uh, charts or customized uh, 2D views. So labels and menus are quite similar. So the first problem that we address in HMD displays, it displays is that they require a lot of space, menus even more than, than labels. As a result, they may occlude geometry or they may be occluded by the geometry or other 2D elements in my, in my view. And of course, we need uh, text to be large enough. And in the case of menus, other components may be also large enough. Uh, regarding to the positioning, uh, labels are typically scene dependent, and in many cases we must ensure that they are always visible and 
oriented towards the user. For menus, since uh, not always are necessary on screen, sometimes can be hidden or moved. However, they require more complex operation because we might have elements such as sliders, checkboxes, pickers, whatever, and they require to uh, find uh, a, a precise operation uh, with them. So um, for, for labels, uh, typical strategies that have been developed are uh, like uh, these object space labels, which are always visible. These have the advantage that uh, if, they, if we put them on, on, on front of the objects, we can always see them. But if they are large, I mean, instead of representing just a single number here, if they are large, they can occlude a lot of geometry. Another possibility is to use a screen space label. So we ensure that there's also no occlusion. We don't have positioning problems, but again, they occupy, they may occupy a lot of space. Um, another way, uh, another common strategy is att attaching the labels to the, to the pointer. So this is useful because the positioning is simplified and they can be made always visible. However, as the pointer changes uh, its orientation, they may, might disappear. So if we need the persistent labels, this cannot be used. There's other possibilities we've been playing with, such as, for instance, making the, the labels only moving front after the user has interacted with the object. So this partially solves the occlusion problem in the sense that they might become an occluded, uh, occluded by the geometry, but of course, when they move on front, they will occlude geometry. And if we need to interact according to the information in the labels, this strategy would be uh, not useful. So what things can we do with labels? So as I said, the limiting factors are basically the required space, the need to, to make them always visible. So uh, maybe we can try some strategies of dynamic labeling, uh, trying to hide the labels when they are not needed, uh, but keeping some visual cues to indicate their presence. We could try to use uh, eye trackers uh, to generate uh, labels on demand, depending on the gaze. I don't know, but I think we, we, this is one of the problems that we need to solve in order to make um, molecular visualization in VR more efficient or more user friendly. User friendly. Regarding menus, uh, we have seen uh, very uh, known strategies that are used in desktop, also in virtual reality. For instance, icon menus, like this example on the left, where the icons represent the action. The problem of, of icon menus is that they have less expressivity because uh, there's um, the user needs to be trained to, in order to understand what the icon means. And the, um, uh, we have to carefully design those icons. On the other hand, we can use also traditional menus. Traditional menus with text and so on are uh, can be less ambiguous but they require huge amounts of the space. Like in this case, for instance, in the top left, you can see that there is one menu in front of the other and so on. So what can we do with menus? Well, as I said, limiting factors is uh, the required space. We also have the problem of uh, the difficult interaction and maybe the opportunities could go in the line of using voice comments. Uh, using some sort of contextual awareness so that we can uh, use menus that are uh, smaller, but are only with the interesting features that we we, we could uh, need in a certain context. Or maybe we could also use some artificial intelligence to facilitate the manipulation of menus to, to help selecting or picking or moving sliders, so on. So, like in the case of menus, data views also require a lot of space. And when I say data views, I refer to the rest. So it's uh, charts, customized to customized to the views, and so on and so forth. So ideally, as I said, we need uh, in our multis packages, we need multiple linked views. And in 3D, they are difficult to present because they occupy a lot of space, and they are difficult to operate because we have problems with selection, as we will talk later. So basically, we have lower precision in selection. This has, as a result, uh, larger interaction times, and we need uh, custom ways to accelerate the selection of the elements in, in, in these data views. On the other hand, uh, some people have analyzed the advantages of producing these views in virtual reality 
and they have shown that they can reduce navigation times versus desktop and certain uh, perceptual estimations can even be go uh, can even uh, be better than with desktop so for instance uh, or, uh, estimating orientations estimating depth and so on and so forth so at some point we we need to add them because they are going to be useful but they are also uh, dangerous or delicate to use so in this example here uh, we can see um, two applications that use uh, data views in, in 3D. So the first uh, one, the fiber clay, is a uh, fiber uh, visualization application that also uses several views, but um, you can only operate with one view at the time. So you have the, the main view, you can switch the main view, but you can operate uh, with a single view. And the, the, the main view lets you select a set of lines, but there is no appropriate or not accurate selection of a single line provided by the, by the, the application. In IMX axis on the right, uh, there's also multiple views, but there is no uh, direct manipulation for data selection uh, provided. So there are manipulations on the axis. And as you may see here, for instance, in this example, uh, while manipulating the axis, some other elements of data, such as the names, uh, the, the label of this axis, might disappear because it's not warranted to be always uh, facing the user or at least uh, properly visible and so on. So it's, it may be a little bit difficult to manipulate the data this way. Very recently, Liu and colleagues, actually this year, presented this in the virtual reality conference where they have a system for uh, small multiples that can be manipulated. However, as in other approaches in, in virtual reality, in order to manipulate some element, you really, really need to get close to it to, uh, for performing a proper selection. And um, if you make many of those small multiples appear on screen and you have to move back, it's basically very difficult to understand unless uh, each of the charts really, really shows a few amounts of items. If you have elements like those, if you move a little bit back and you have like 16 of those, it's very difficult to understand what's being encoded if you're not very, very close. So what are the opportunities I, I see in, in, in data views? So, um, I think it's it's very challenging uh, currently to have multiple coordinated views in the same field of view. So I have no clear clues on, on how this could be solved. I mean, we could expect to have larger resolutions for uh, HMD devices, but we maybe could think on some purpose-specific abstractions that require less space, although being expressive enough. Uh, presenting details on demand, which is a particular case of data views, uh, is, is also a challenging issue because most of details on demand or a lot of details on demand views involve showing text. And as I was saying before, showing text requires very, very big uh, room in, in our virtual reality setup. So let's move on uh, to the problem of data interaction. There are several ways to interact in a, in a virtual reality device. So we can have gesture interaction, we can have physical navigation and locomotion, and other techniques such as sketching and interaction, gaze interaction, or using some touch-based uh, techniques such as tactile devices or data physicalization. In, in our environments, we uh, are going to interact with either 3D objects, but also with menus or charts. If, if we want to mimic, as I was saying, the, the Moldis uh, applications we currently have in desktop. So um, if we move, uh, if we think on the on the on the taxonomy by by her and Schneiderman, uh, we could divide the interaction uh, techniques for vision analysis into these three categories: so data and view specification, view manipulation, and process, process and provenance. From those here, I will only comment on some cases, such as filtering, for instance, and selection and navigation or exploring in virtual reality headsets. Uh, but you know. Um, there are diff other different types that could be analyzed. So regarding filtering, uh, uh, we commonly have two different scenarios. So either the items to be filtered are already known, and thus what we need to do is issuing a certain comment, or they are don't know, and then we need to select them maybe one by one, 
or by groups, and then issue the comment. The comment is typically uh, issued either using a gesture, which depending on the technology we're using may have the different degrees of precision. For instance, if you if you use the MIO armband in order to issue gestures, we have uh, some problems of gesture recognition, but also uh, quite significant latency. We can also use your comments by voice, which is pretty tempting. But if you think of the elements that we might be interested in selecting in, 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 in molecular rendering, we may end up having to uh, spell uh, some strange words or complicated words that might be, uh, may, may require a lot of time to, to spell them. Uh, using menus, that it's uh, another possibility, requires selection, that it's something I'm going to analyze later. And also some techniques also uh, use typing, but typing in virtual reality is, is incredibly slow. So we can gather some ideas from some other techniques. For instance, this uh, idea by the, the guys from Replite, or Replit. Uh, they use a mixed command line and, and graphical uh, user interface that uh, basically builds a, a tree that it's refined in real time so that they can combine the uh, typing uh, a single letter or a couple of letters with the use of a mouse. So this kind, this kind of idea could also be borrowed uh, in order to facilitate the, the filtering uh, of data in, in molecular visualization applications uh, in virtual reality. So, for, for me, one of the important things is that issuing complex commands is, is complicated in virtual reality. So we have uh, several uh, opportunities or several things that we could do. We could work with uh, context-aware filtering uh, tasks. So trying to guess what the user is, is willing to filter. So uh, we help him or her to reduce the, the number of actions. We could also work on better gesture recognition, of course. And we also need for these kind of complex interactions, the, the support for undoing actions, because if they are prone to errors, we need to easily be able to go back to the previous stage. We can also, as I was saying, try to uh, mimic the, the, the user interface by Replit, trying to um, creating filtering comments uh, on the fly that are adapted to uh, the current input of the user. So um, let's go to the, to the selection. So what's the problem with molecular models? Molecular models are typically dense elements with very small components. So accurate selection requires precision. And there is a lot of uh, occlusion. So we need to reveal non-visible objects if you want to travel to a certain place of the molecule. And navigating in 3D is complex and time consuming. So we also need to find the adequate speeds to avoid uh, getting make, making the user get sick. And um, we have uh, using physical uh, walking is typically limited because the environment we have is like three meters, something like that. So we cannot walk indefinitely. And as I say, we must avoid uh, motion sickness. So there are two main typical approaches uh, of selection. There are more, but the, mo the mostly use are rebase selection. The good thing of the rebase selection is that typically we require less amount of navigation. And there's also hand-based selection. In hand-based selection, we need we need to get close to the object to select. And this can be done with real walking or simulated walking or other interactions. So uh, one of the in ray-based selection, we always find two typical problems. So the first one is the occlusion of the ray versus the occlusion of the eye. So there are solutions for this approach, such as rays that are originate in the eye but are controlled by the by the by the controller. But in most um, um, virtual reality applications, you still find that the the rays issuing from the controller. So we have this this occlusion problem. And then we also have the second uh, problem that it's uh, we need to access to interior elements. So this is also related to. Occlusion, and I'm going to talk about occlusion elements. There's a, a paper by 2008 that they were proposing like uh, 50 different occlusion management techniques for virtual reality. So there is a lot of literature to, to test and, and we should find the adequate for, for our, our goal. But it's also related to navigation that it's something I'm, I'm going to visit uh, after this. So um, an, an issue that it's important when, uh, when using ray-based techniques 
is that um, clicking the, the controller, uh, this is an uh, HTC Vive controller, will perturbate the, 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 the ray direction. Yeah. In contrast to desktop-based selection with the mouse, where the movement of the of the of the button of the mouse is perpendicular to the surface where we where we put the mouse, and therefore there is uh, less or the possibility of of modifying the the mouse position is smaller. In 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 virtual reality controllers, basically whatever we are going to do, either gripping or using the touchpad or clicking a menu or the trigger, will modify the ray. So this is kind of problematic because with our hand in the air, that it's per se, not uh, static, this uh, will generate even more imprecision in the selection. Uh, for menus, this was for 3D structures, for menus we have the same problems, although in some cases we have uh, uh, less degree uh, of freedom in other when we move uh, because we don't have that, but anyway. So um, there are several ways that have been addressing this task. For instance, IATK, they perform selection using a uh, hand drawn. So by moving the hand, you can select a bunch of elements. However, selecting a single element with this kind of inter in, in interface is, is kind of uh, difficult. Or in virtual virtualytics VR, uh, what they do is array-based selection. And of course, in order to select something that is here, uh, if we had a, a regular desktop, we could do it with a mouse by clicking here, but in a, in a virtual reality setup, you really need to get close to this before you are able to select it. So this is uh, time consuming, and this is also fatiguing because you need to move uh, the, the, the model more than you, you would like to. So there, in, in VR, in classical VR techniques, they have adapted some uh, desktop-based metaphors, such as the expanding targets here, where uh, the ray, when it gets close to a target that can be selected, uh, makes the target uh, to expand. Or the sticky targets that the ray is attracted by the elements that can be selected. On the, on the back side for molecular models, the one that we have with huge molecules of uh, many thousands of atoms and so on, both of them can have problems. In this case, for instance, expanding targets might occlude other geometry that we would be willing to select. Or for the sticky targets, we'd have, we could have the same problem that in, the same, in, the, in a closer uh, 3D neighborhood, we might, might have many elements that we would, would be trying to attract the ray. In, in medical visualization, we have also worked with uh, data aware assistance for uh, precision selection of points on the surface. Okay, and this is some an idea that can be can be a good candidate. However, uh, we still have the problem of, of the free ray moving. So one of the things that we developed, for instance, was a two stage technique that is uh, in virtual reality is called the ray lock technique. That first. At, uh, um, at either where assistance helps you selecting a ray, and after this ray is fixed, uh, other movements of the of the of the controller will let you refine on the points that again this this in this case the points are also data aware, so they are selected among candidate points in the intersection of surfaces. So um, in in molecular models, we uh, what. What we need typically is to select points in a 3D neighborhood, not a longer ray. So one thing that we could do, and this is something we're experimenting with, is uh, having a, 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 an initial lock of a certain atom and providing certain, um, um, the possibility of selecting the atoms in the neighborhood by uh, uh, using the touchpad. So in this case here, as you see here, there's one atom that it's initially selected, like uh, equivalent to the ray lock, and then several arrows appear that represent the, the, the direction of the touch, but we need to uh, activate in order to select the, the element in the neighborhood. In this case, it's a 3D neighborhood, not a long array. The problem of this approach is that since we are not always uh, static, if we uh, slightly move back or forth, we might, uh, in this case, moving back, uh, a little bit, uh, half a step or something, uh, some element could appear uh, on top of the currently selected atom. And as I said, this is a, an occlusion management problem that should be visited too. We also tested other visual cues such, such as this uh, ring here, but it seems that the, the one of the arrows seems more user-friendly, but of course we couldn't do any uh, user study for the moment. 
To sum up, um, when selecting elements uh, with the hand in the air, we have let, less precision than tools like the mouse. And um, if we uh, add to this the fact that uh, both in 3D and 2D views, uh, we have uh, small elements present, it's challenging to select them accurately. So um, new methods are required to make the selection process more accurate. And this might come from data guided, guided techniques, or another idea could be creating selection methods that mix modalities such as voice and 3D interaction in the spirit of the method by Replit that I showed before. Okay, so let's move to another uh, interaction technique, navigation. In molecular models, especially large molecules, we may have uh, uh, large distances or relatively large distance to, to, to cover. So in, in virtual reality, some custom navigation modes have been created. The problem of these custom navigation modes is that you may lose the, the, the sensation of immersion or presence. And of course, we also uh, may have the problem of motion sickness. Uh, motion sickness is something that happens when um, the, the optical flow of sure does not match with the vestibular and proprioceptive information that appears when you're doing real movement inside a, a virtual reality scenario. So uh, in Nanome, for instance, they, they use a, a well-known technique that it's uh, dragging the object. However, dragging the object might be not suitable for large environments because it's fatiguing. So they have the gorilla arm syndrome. It's time consuming and it might be kind of cumbersome because depending on the movements, if you're navigating through a tunnel, it can be, uh, you might easily go outside the tunnel and it can be uh, uh, difficult to, to find the, the point of interest. Um, another technique that it's used in, in virtual reality techniques for navigating larger scenarios is the walking place, where the user basically walks without moving the, the his or position in this case. And um, this, is kind, this is quite suitable because it maintains the sense of presence, but you have uh, to be aware on the speeds and adaption to, to different speeds in order to avoid motion signals. Another also well-known technique is this world on miniature. And in, this, uh, in the approach by Xia and others, they were using a working miniature that could have different scales for different users, which is interesting, but for molecular visualization where we are going to likely have a lot of occlusion, I don't think that this can uh, work uh, for all scenarios. So for navigation, the most limiting factors is that in order to keep presence and engagement, we need uh, natural interaction. We also need to reduce time and we need to uh, avoid fatigue. So the opportunities that we have here is uh, adapting or creating new metaphors for navigation in 3D. For instance, we could try to adapt the walking place if we need to navigate into tunnels, getting uh, like some information of the data, for instance. But I don't know, it's, there's some things, there's a lot of things that I think that can be improved. And finally, let's go to collaboration, which is an important uh, thing that uh, in molecular visualization is, uh, uh, they use a lot. So there are several collaborations and scenarios. Uh, we can think of synchronous collocated, synchronous distributed, asynchronous collocated or asynchronous distributed, and I mostly concentrate on synchronous collocated scenarios. So in, this, uh, in these scenarios, what we need to, uh, to solve is the problem of uh, communication such verbal and gestural communication. We also need to provide awareness of the other's positions and actions in order to avoid uh, collisions, for instance. And we have the problems of the viewpoint selection. So having a context that is shared or it's not shared and the interaction is shared or it's not shared with, with the other users. So we have uh, different uh, ways of, 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 of dealing with this that I'm going to, to mention. So regarding communication, um, verbal communication is kind of easy to solve because most HMDs have microphones and earphones, but we have to ensure that we have no delay, especially if we, if we want to perform remote synchronous collaboration. The gestures, on the other hand, are, they are not so easy because uh, you may lose a gesture if the user is not visible from your point of view. So this, this is related to the, to the awareness of the other user's positions. So what I refer to the user's awareness. So the problem of user's awareness is that we need to know where the other users are to avoid collisions. And in order to do this, we need representations that are not uh, with low latency. 
So uh, one common approach or popular approach is using heads to represent the other users as, as we see here in this example. So uh, regarding the collaboration, the shared context and the interaction, there are several tasks that are common in virtual reality collaborative systems, such as division, pointing and annotation. And, and all of them have uh, an important uh, core thing is that uh, we need to know where we are, what we are looking at, and sometimes we need to switch to the other user's uh, viewpoint. So uh, concerning the, the, the interaction, it could be non-shared. I mean, we could have a different viewpoint for each user with their own annotation and manipulation. However, this makes us unaware of the other user's actions and views. We can share the same view for, for all the users. However, this uh, provides lack of control and there, then there would, it also may cause a mismatch between the 3D awareness of the user's positions with what I think that he or she should be looking at or could be looking at uh, because I see where they are with their head avatar, for instance. So a better way that it's the best of all worlds is having configurable web viewpoints um, that lets you switch views from one to the other. This offers both control and also flexibility. So one way of sharing views is taking images. We can capture an image and show to the other users, like in the photo portals, although they are statics, and or the other example here on the right, where uh, if we point to a user, there's a menu that lets me change uh, to see what he or she is, lo is looking at, and then the, the viewpoint changes in order to see what he or she is looking at. So um, there's other techniques she and others let you guide to the other users by tapping them and showing some visual guides that uh, let the other user follow the path you went to explore the, 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 the model. Or we can also have, think of uh, role views. So we can, we can have different views depending on the role you're adopting. For instance, if you are a tutor or you're a student, maybe from the point of view of the tutor, you, you, you can copy or you want to copy a view so that the student sees something that you want to, to explain, like in the case of Stepan and others. Or we can have a, a even more flexible scenarios where there is a teacher and many students. And the teacher can have uh, different roles, I mean, uh, can, can uh, hope to the view of each of the students. Or in, in, in this case, for instance, we can have different modes. So, a teaching mode that everybody can see or an exam mode where only the, the teacher can see what the uh, individual students are doing and so on and so forth. So in collaboration, as I said, there are also important challenges. The limiting factors is that we need the, to know the user awareness, which is uh, it might be difficult if we want to have uh, to combine hybrid systems such as HMD with a smartphone. And uh, in order to, 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 to facilitate, we have to offer opportunities to share in different ways the viewpoints. So uh, we, we have here also opportunities to um, try to get, create new techniques for sharing data or sharing, no, um, letting the user, the user know what I'm, where I'm pointing, what I have been annotating, and so on and so forth. And this also extends to other data such as uh, charts that uh, was not commented. So in order to conclude very quickly, I think that uh, although there are very interesting works already done, I think there are many, many challenges ahead, uh, refer to display, interaction, collaboration, collaboration, but also perception, that is something I, I, I did not mention. And in this case, I also believe that our community is very well positioned because we have previous experience both in perception, in visualization, in interaction, and some of us also have a previous experience in computer graphics and virtual reality. So with this, uh, I finish my talk. I hope that nobody got slept. Uh, slept. And uh, I also want to thank my colleagues of the Verbic Group because they helped me a lot, providing me some videos, images, and so on and so forth. Yeah, thanks a lot, Perry Paul. <clears throat> that was a very nice talk. Um, let's have a look to the to the questions. First, there's a question from Xavier. Um, thanks for this interesting talk. Do you think navigation could partially solve selection issues? 
Well, I think that can actually accelerate some selection issues. But, you know, um, compared to, 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 to what you do with a mouse, which you are, where you are very precise, you, with, there is a still a lot of uh, delay in, in what I think that navigation plus selection can, can do. Mm. As itself, of course, some smart techniques can, can, can go much faster. So there are a lot of clapping hands here. Uh, meanwhile, nice. uh, another question from my side. So did you experiment with a large number of different labels in 3D space? Because especially if you, for example, use labels for atoms and protein structures, you will have a lot of different labels on yeah. top of each other. So be before, before uh, I was kicked out of the lab, let's say, I was uh, testing some applications where I, I think I don't remember exactly if it was Unity Mall. I think that was one of these virtual reality applications that, that, that was able to label a lot of things. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's kind of complicated. Of course, it's, if it's only the name of the atom, maybe it's not occluding that much. And, and depending on how you treat the font, if the font contrasts enough, maybe you don't need the background, but it's, it's kind of dangerous. I mean, they imagine, for instance, you have in the background, if you try to label atoms or you try to label elements, it will, be, it will occlude everything. Mm. I mean, with, with stereoscopic cues, it still works a little bit, but of course, it's still kind of a mess. Let, let me have a look. Um, another question from Xavier: Do you have some tools, prototypes, demos to the to test the visualization interaction techniques you propose? No, I mean, we are developing with with one student. We are developing some of the things that you. I mean, we we have several several projects. We have a collaboration project where some of the of the videos were taken from. We also have a, a molecular visualization project, which is a student, but it was kind of interrupted a little bit. So he's working from home, but he doesn't have an HMD display. So it's it's supposed to 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 finish this um, some let's say smart selection techniques before the end of the of the semester. But uh, you know, it's it's difficult to to get to know. They are not planning to get back to the university. So we are unsure whether we are going to be able to test them before the end of the semester with the real devices. Yeah, yeah. That's great. So uh, so by the way, um, you were talking in the, in the beginning, you were talking about the different HMDs and that you looked mm -hmm. at the resolutions. So do you think 4K resolution is a big deal or do you, because you mentioned, I think you need four times the resolution if you want to work. Yeah, you need, you need basically 8K. I mean, there is one device, which is the Pmax, but, but now uh, among, the, among the Steam users, it's only 0.3% of users that they have this device. And I haven't, we don't have this device, so I don't know how far the GPU is, uh, how fast the GPU is able to generate things. I, I, I think it's, it's kind of, it will be kind of limited because the, the current power, the GPUs are not, especially for the 3D thing, you know, uh, are not good enough, um, but we'll see. And of course, I, I would also like to know, I would also like to test how small can the, uh, everything that it's not 3D models can be done, like text and so on, and still remain legible. So uh, I think it's, it's something that's interesting, mm, but I think we, we still need to wait for some years for the hardware to be there. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there are no more questions. So maybe then a final question. Oh, was there one? Uh -huh. <laughs> so some people are waiting for the 8K uh, HMDs. I think if you can invest a couple of uh, thousand dollars, it's possible. So, but as you said, then the hardware might be still the problem behind that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so may maybe just a final question off topic. Are you still using caves? Well, we have the cave, but we are uh, most of the projects we have now are H and D. Yeah, yeah. Because I don't know, they are really, really attractive for the students. They see these in our courses and they want to test them, and and they are kind of uh, in in our case, for instance, they are easier uh, to use because we have a lab, so they can. But you know, now it's it's very difficult because in in this uh, you cannot. I mean, you have to ensure that you clean them. And now with the virus thing going on, so it's even more complicated. Uh, so that the the what it's been a, an explosion is that that uh, it's something that we we will have a lot because everybody will have their HMD. Well, everybody, a lot of people will have their HMD at home. So yeah. it, it it has exploded actually the use of uh, of virtual reality, but not in the current setup we are used. That we have a lab, we have a, a, a small amount of, of 
this place and we have to, we can share with the others so it's it's kind of uh, delicate now to do this mm. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. That would be an interesting development in the future. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, Per, thanks a lot for this amazing talk. I think, especially if there are young students, there are a lot of PhD topics that just have to dig through your talk. So there's a lot to find there on opportunities. So thanks a lot. So I think this brings us to the closing of the conference. So I will try to share my screen just a moment. Also don't know if Jan maybe still wants to join us. Um, but first, let me share my screen. We can do that. Is my screen time to spare? Let me check it. Yes, that looks good. Great. <laughs> so, Michael is also there. Yeah, so on behalf of my uh, co-chairs, Michael and Jan, I would like to conclude this conference. Maybe they still have to, if you have some remarks, guys, please just post them in the, in the chat. So first of all, we had two amazing invited talks. So the first one was from Mathieu. He might not be here because he's joining the other conferences and he had to help out. And then Perry Powell's uh, talk, which we just heard, was also very amazing. Then we had um, three um, papers, so we had two full papers and one short paper. These were also some very interesting topics. Um, what I uh, have to mention here, there is a, a Reddit communication going on from EG, so there you see the link here, so feel free to join there, the communication. Basically, you can discuss different papers there in the background. Which brings us to our final slide. Um, basically, this concludes the MOVIA, so thanks a lot for your participation. Our questions to us. Uh, first of all, if you still have general questions, please please post them now. You have something like 30 seconds time to do so. Um, other than this, basically, thanks a lot. So we hope to see you again next year. So we are discussing to um, continue with small VA. I think it, yeah, it's quite successful on a small scale. So we hope to continue with this process. And I think um, from, my, from our side as organizers, we have to say, Thanks a lot to the organizers of the Eurovis and the EG that they did not give up because you know that we, for example, we canceled the VISB conference, which is of course a conference which does not make so much sense um, because you know, um, in terms of doing this virtually. So this is really the conference where we try to meet in person. So really thanks a lot for this great work that this was all transferred into the virtual space in such a quick manner. Um, so if you have topics for next year, please feel free to contact us. We are open for everything regarding molecular visual visualization. If you have an idea for a paper, please join us or for a special issue, please um, send us an email to morevea.eurovis.gmail.com. Here's our URL. Um, I don't, uh, oh, oh, okay, there's a question. Uh, um, just a moment. Oh, that would have been a question for this moment. That is per power. Okay, I think there are no, no general questions anymore. These were specific questions on per power. So um, I hope to see you um, in the other co uh, conference venues here at the Eurovis. So I think it was a very nice kickoff. So thank you for joining us until now. And then we hope to see you next year again. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.